Closed captioning of this program is made possible by the Fireman's Fund Foundation. This week, the Federal Communications Commission moves to bring broadband to all Americans, including those in poor and rural communities. Should public power developed by cities and counties require voter approval? That's the question posed by Proposition 16 on the June ballot. Farmers in the Central Valley will get more water under new federal water allocations, and the Bay Area can expect less rationing and the unique visual style of painter Wayne Tebow. You certainly can paint anything that you want. The only problem is that it has to be good. Coming up next. Davis, welcome to This Week in Northern California. Joining me on our news panel, Paul Rogers, environment writer with the San Jose Mercury News on water allocations in California. Rebecca Smith, reporter for the Wall Street Journal on Proposition 16. And Laura Seidel, digital culture correspondent for NPR on the FCC's National Broadband Plan. Laura Seidel, this week the Mercury News carried an editorial that started with, few proposals before Congress will have a broader effect on U.S. society than the National Broadband Plan released this week. That's quite a mouthful. It is what quite is a mouthful. This? <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and it's true to some degree. This is, this is like a moment when we uh, electrified the country or built the railroads. Basically what's happening is that the FCC has said that broadband is essential that this is no longer just something, oh, if you have it, it's okay. They've realized that in order to exist today, in order to be an educated person, in order to move ahead competitively, in order to find a job, you, you really have to go online. And so no matter who you are or where you live, you need access to high-speed internet. So that's what it's about. So does it go past this, uh, you need it because it will help you, or, or the, does it have an impact on the nation in yeah. what way? Well, that's, I think that's important here. There is money behind this, mm -hmm. and exactly how much really the FCC is a little vague. But what they want to do is make sure there's a lot of rural areas. For example, in California alone, there's about 1.4 million people in rural California who don't have any kind of broadband connection. Um, I was just up in Trinity County, where they have 14,000 people in, in the whole county. And many of them are not connected at all, and what they do have, it's, it's very, very slight. So places like that, this would set aside money to bring them a connection. Also, poor areas, um, you know, in, say, Oakland or uh, areas, Live Oak community right outside of, uh, of Santa Cruz, um, there are people there who just can't afford a connection. This might help subsidize those people to be able to get a connection. But it's also a bit vague, and I think that's immediately where you're starting to see criticism about it. It's, it's a big, broad plan. It's big. It's like <laughs> 300 pages, and I can't wade through the whole thing yet. But um, it, it's regardless, it's actually a little vague. Well, give us the, uh, the nuts and bolts. I mean, this is going to be uh, at least 10 times as fast, if not faster, than the current broadband that you get through Comcast or any other uh, service. And Who's going to pay for it and who's going to own it, the government or private companies? Who's going to put all these wires down around the country? Well, I think that's, that's a good question, and some of this, in fact, is vague. In terms of paying for it, they've, had, they've got a couple ideas. Right now, you probably, when you get your phone bill, you might notice something. It says universal service. You pay a tax, and that tax has gone to help bring telephone lines to poor people, telephone lines um, to rural areas, and the government decided to do that. They're going to start to shift that money over towards paying for broadband for the same people. So that's one place. The other place, they want to auction off television spectrum, what they call unused television spectrum. Mm -hmm. And as you and I were talking about before, that's a little bit contentious. Uh, not touchy if you're a TV station. Touchy if you're a TV station, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, and in fact, the television stations are saying it could interfere with their signals if they auction off this spectrum. Um, the FCC is saying that's not true. So will the government own all the wires? Um, the government will not own all the wires. And that is the other thing, is that this plan definitely, much, definitely talks about a public-private partnership. And as to who would actually get the money to build this out, that is another thing that's vague. 
So, so one of the things that's kind of interesting about this is it appears that the government is still saying to AT&T and the big companies, go ahead and build out your system and you can still control it, which of course is not what we've seen, for example, with the electric system, where at some point the government says, now we need open access. We need other competitive carriers to be allowed onto this to offer competitive services. We're not, we don't appear to be headed that direction. That is not where we appear to be headed. And there are a lot of activists, a lot of people who are really interested in this, who are not happy about that fact at all. They feel that in fact, these companies should be forced to open up their lines. For example, up in Trinity County, where I just was, AT&T has a line going right through that they're connecting major cities, but they're not connecting that community. And other providers, local people, have approached them and said, can we rent some of your fiber so that we can build out here? And AT&T's like, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. And they don't have to. So a lot of people think that the government should be able to tell AT&T, you know what, you, you have to rent this at a reasonable wholesale price that will determine to these people because they'll build it out. Why, why not connect everybody? Uh, because commerce depends now on this. I'm, I understand that maybe we can get a reduction in the health care cost if you know, everybody's online with speed enough to, to be effective. Well, I think, I think the FCC is saying, yeah, let's connect everybody. It's just a question of how and who's going to get the money. Under this plan, I think the concern is that it's just going to go to the same. Basically, every, there's a duopoly right now. You have a choice between either the phone company or the cable company, and that's it. And it looks like this money may go to the same people, but they will build it out. I mean, that is the idea that whoever gets it would build this out. Everybody will have it. And it is essential. You can't get a job, you know, you, anymore. You can, you've got to go online to find but a job. One of the problems you know? even now is that even if you live in an area that has high speed access, the cost is really high. Yeah. I mean, Personally, I, I think that my phone bill is one of the bills I least enjoy paying <laughs> because it always feels like I'm paying more than I should be. Uh -huh. So how is the government going to address that? Because as I understand it, it's much cheaper in Europe. You know, you're right. Service. And in fact, uh, this is an important point. We were talking about this before. The United States is now number 15 in the world in terms of, of pricing, access, speed mm -hmm. of the internet. And that's why people say you should force these big companies to rent out their lines because they have done that in Europe and it's brought the price down. Well, now yeah. we're going to move to another utility. Yes, yeah, another utility. Well, <laughs> yeah. uh, Rebecca Smith, you are going to talk to us about Proposition six, 16. Why is PG&E backing this? Well, I, first of all, I would say is Prop 16 is not Sweet 16. <laughs> it's, it, in fact, is a very sort of malign effort, I would say, on the part of PG&E to try to control something. Um, and let me take a step back from this. Basically, it says that if you are a city that wants to form your own public power buying agency, instead of just having your public officials approve this, and then normally, as we all know, they have uh, scores of public hearings before they would take a step so momentous. Instead of allowing that process to go forward, which is part of the law now, you're instead going to have to go to the people and get a two-thirds vote. A two-thirds vote, as we know, is the kiss of death. <laughs> it's the thing that the legislature is struggling with on the budget right now. It's a way of stopping anything from happening. So I think basically what it says is that PG&E figures they don't want to fight these little battles city by city. They want something in the state constitution, which is another form of hubris, I would say, that would prevent this from happening without this two-thirds vote. It's, it's a very unusual step for a corporation to take. And if cities uh, set up their own, or, or nonprofits set up their own power companies, obviously they take away customers from PG&E, which would seem to be PG&E's main motivation for uh, bankrolling this entire measure pretty much by themselves. What are the, the cities that already have power companies, municipal power companies like Santa Clara or Sacramento, what are they doing in response to this? Well, this is one of the interesting things. Right now, the law ostensibly was only supposed to prevent new agencies from forming. But in fact, there's language in it that has really gotten municipal utilities excited, and it has resurrected a titanic historic battle between public power and shareholder-owned utilities. Now, interestingly enough, this battle is only being fought right now in Northern California because PG&E is the one that's been stirring it up. I don't hear a peep out of Southern California. I think because they have a truce for the most part with their municipal utilities and they don't want to they don't want to mess things up again. But um, the question is, is PG&E just really trying to stop these new agencies or is it trying to get at the existing, the Merced, the Modesto, there are all these irrigation mm -hmm. districts out in the Central Valley. Santa Clara has its own municipal utility. All of these long-standing organizations. Redding's had, it, had its own muni since, I think, the 1890s. Mm -hmm. 
they say that it would basically make it impossible for them to go forward with business as usual because they'd have to keep going to the public for this two-thirds vote just to take in, let's say, a new subdivision or hmm. bring in a new company. Oh, I saw Willie Brown actually came out on the side of PG&E, and he said that when something costs this much money, when you're talking about uh, spending so much for utilities, the public, there should be two-thirds. I can't imagine. I found that really very uh, surprising. And also, when he was at the public hearing uh -huh. and spoke to that effect, he made it sound as if he thought that these cities were going to be buying the entire electric system. You know, historically, <sighs> these utilities were able to block these efforts by saying, OK, you want to form a new utility. You have to buy our power plants there, our substations, our wires. And they mm -hmm. would establish an exaggerated price for that. And it would stop these efforts cold. Nationally, there has been no immunity movement since the 1950s. Mm. The big utilities have blocked it. This was one effort in California to say, look, we see there's a surplus of capacity out there. We think maybe some cities might be able to do some deals, maybe get greener power than a utility would provide. And so there was this one little avenue that was permitted after an exhaustive process at the legislature. So this has happened in Marin. So that's yes. the Yes, mm, they'll be the first, starting in May. Yeah. yeah, they would have so, a green. Marin has a, is that right? They're proposing yeah. to offer a 100% renewable energy product. Can you give me the short version of exactly what happens? Say Marin does this. It still has to deal with PG&E. Does PG&E get to make money from them in any way? That's, you know, these are all these things are really interesting. PG&E still owns the wires, the energy delivery business. That power would still go to Marin County over their system. It's simply that this new public power agency would be able to go out and contract with, let's say, uh, Shell or maybe a renewable energy developer, or maybe Calpine, some other company for the power. And it would be a nonprofit, so they're arguing your, your rates would be lower, and others are saying, no, it probably wouldn't. I mean, that yeah, seems to be up in the air. In, in a way, you might say mm -hmm. PG&E's reaction seems so exaggerated. It's killing a bug with a howitzer. Mm -hmm. Why are they so agitated about this? And what I really think is that at some point, they're seeing all this cost of the renewable energy they're buying is going to hit our bills. Already, just this week in Los Angeles, they said they're going to have to raise rates 8 to 28% in part to cover the cost of renewable energy. And I think we're just on the cusp of that okay. here in Northern California. Fights underway, a uh, constitutional amendment on the June 8th ballot, Proposition 16. Well, another hot issue that won't go away, and that's water. So, Paul uh, Rogers, what impact will the new federal allocations have down in the Central Valley, and how will it affect us here in the Bay Area? Well, we're all talking about utilities tonight, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and the one thing about uh, water and power and, I guess, uh, your computer uh, service is most people only notice it when they're turned off, when it suddenly goes away, then it's a crisis. And in California, for the last three years, we've had a crisis. We've had the first drought since the late uh, 1980s, the one that went 87 to 1991. And most of Northern Californians have had uh, not to worry at all about brown lawns and farmers have had plenty of water and fish have had plenty of water. But in the last three years, it hasn't rained and snowed as much. And uh, the federal and state agencies which pump water from the Delta uh, have been delivering less. And remember, the Delta is sort of the linchpin of California's whole water supply because we have the Sierra Nevada, it snows in the Sierra, it melts, it comes down 20 different rivers, it flows into the Sacramento River and the San Joaquin, which meet in the Delta and go out under the Golden Gate Bridge. Well, we've put giant pump systems on the south part of the Delta to bring water to cities and farms like San Jose, Los Angeles, San Joaquin Valley farmers. And in recent years, uh, as I say, because of the drought, less water has been pumped. And also, we've had endangered species issues. There are mm -hmm. salmon populations crashing, delta smelt, sturgeon steelhead. And so the government and judges have cranked back on the pumping. And a lot of the farmers have been getting upset. Well, what happened this week was the federal government announced, because of all the rain we've had this spring, uh, they would be delivering more water than uh, people thought a month or two ago. And that means two things. More for the farmers, although they still say they need more. Uh, and it means that no water agency in the Bay Area uh, will have any kind of mandatory rationing um, this summer. First time in four years for, for that. So, so does this mean, Paul, that the big uh, bond measure, the $11 billion bond, is probably going to go down? It's a good question. You remember uh, six months ago, the big news, maybe nine months ago now, the whole legislature was, was gridlocked because Democrats didn't want to build any new dams and Republicans wanted dams and Democrats wanted water conservation and all this talk about a peripheral canal and uh, around the Delta. And the compromise was 
let's put something on the ballot, an $11 billion bond. Some of the money will go to build new dams to store more water. Some will go to study a peripheral canal. Some will go for conservation. The problem is uh, water measures, I think, tend to do better when people see a crisis. When your lawn's brown and they're telling you, if you don't vote for this, the whole economy could go down because we're in a dry state, um, it's easier to vote to put the state in more debt. But when you have so much debt already, the state's $20 billion in debt right now, and everybody's lawn's green, it's harder to get those votes. What would it, you know, there's, there's that, there's the fact that people actually have to, to see it. But why aren't people seeing it? Um, we, we actually are having a crisis. This was a good year, but from what I'm reading, it's not going to make up for the fact that we've had several really bad yeah, years. It's, it's starting to. That has been the message all spring. The message all spring was, yeah, it's raining a lot, but we have these big reservoirs all over the state, like Shasta and San Luis Reservoir, that aren't full up. You know, Basically, it was like a checking account that was overdrawn, mm -hmm. and after three dry years, we need a lot more to fill them up. Well, those reservoirs are actually filling up now. Shasta is the largest reservoir in the state. It's 81% full. But it's a problem really solved. I mean, for all of my life, yeah. we've been talking about some sort of infrastructure system that would take the guesswork out of what years we'd get water and would not. Isn't that still needed, and is anybody interested in it? We talked about the bond measure that was supposed to be. This will, the, Californians the will always be fighting over this. Most of California gets 15 inches of rain a year, it's the same amount as Morocco. Now, without the world's largest system of dams, canals, and pumps, we would be like Wyoming. We'd be making cow chips, not computer <laughs> chips. And so, you know, power in California goes with the water. Development goes with the water. And so we will be fighting about this forever. And what's complicated it is, with the fish populations crashing in the delta, the most powerful environmental law in the world is the Endangered Species Act. And so the only choice is, do we waive the Endangered Species Act and try and, you know, keep pumping more water, kill the rest of the smelt, kill the rest of the salmon, which is upsetting the commercial fishing industry, or do farmers and cities in dry years make do with less? Senator Feinstein had talked a couple of weeks ago about trying to go around the Endangered Species Act. A lot of Northern California environmental groups and fellow Democrats freaked out, and she, ba she backed off of that. But we'll always be fighting over this. And in the end, farmers and cities are going to have to use less. Well. Using less is <laughs> sort of his part of the Except answer. Except for in rainy years yeah. like that. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, my thanks to all of you for bringing us to date up, up on the important issues of electric power, computers, and water. <laughs> and now some other news from this week. Gubernatorial candidate Steve Posner and Meg Whitman debated for the first time Monday in Southern California. The latest poll on the governor's race shows Whitman well ahead of her Republican rival, Posner, and with a slight lead over the sole Democratic contender, Attorney General Jerry Brown. A poll also shows that U.S. Senator Barbara Boxer losing ground against all of her GOP opponents. California workers' share of their contribution for employer-backed health coverage went up 83% from the year 2000 to 2008, even though incomes stayed the same. The report commissioned by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for the annual Cover the Uninsured Week found middle-class workers have been hardest hit. The controversial $940 billion health care overhaul bill is expected to be voted on by the House over the weekend. An Alameda County Superior Court ruling on land use in Pleasanton may have implications for development in all of California. The judge found a 1996 voter-approved cap limiting new housing to curb growth and congestion violates a state law requiring cities to make land available for regional housing needs. And NUMI workers have approved a proposed severance package offered by Toyota. Each of the 4,600 employees will receive from a little over $21,000 to more than $70,000, depending on their length of service. The auto plan in Fremont is scheduled to close on April 1st. The San Jose Museum of Art is holding a retrospective exhibition of the work of Wayne Tebow, one of the country's most renowned artists. The Northern California painter is known for his pop art images of ordinary objects like pies and cakes. We see what's behind those delicious looking still lifes in this story from KQED's Spark Production. We started out uh, with a, the idea to do a 
a plate down the lower right hand corner of donuts or a pie or something. That's what those sketches are. And then uh, I liked more of the starkness of the thing and then decided to really uh, concentrate on that surface. At 88, artist Wayne Tebow still spends most of each day painting in his downtown Sacramento studio. It's a work ethic he picked up in his early training as a sign painter and later as a commercial artist. I didn't go to art school. Worked in commercial art and all kinds of things. And you get up, you go to work, whether you like it or not. <laughs> That's uh, what I thought painters do. You get up and go to work. Having spent several decades as one of America's most recognizable and critically acclaimed visual artists, Thibaut shows no sign of resting on his laurels. His love of painting compels him to constantly create new work. The wonderful thing about painting as a human invention, it over a 30,000 year period has been able to anthologize a kind of sum of human consciousness. All of our sides, the most majestic, wonderful spiritual ideas, all the way down to the brute level of terror and horrendous inhumanity to man. And you certainly can paint anything that you want. The only problem is that it has to be good. Wayne Tebow was born in Mesa, Arizona in 1920 and started his art career in the 40s as a cartoonist and illustrator. He first gained national and international acclaim as part of the pop art movement in the early 60s. Like other pop artists, he took a closer look at humble, everyday objects. Cakes and pie, gumball machines, shoes, even lipsticks, all rendered with tactile brush strokes and a keen sense of color. But the classic feel of Thibaut's still lifes set him apart, and soon he was considered a leading figure in a new wave of 20th century figurative painters. Over the years, Thibaut's subject matter has changed, encompassing portraits and landscapes in addition to objects. Most of the imagery is drawn from his own life experiences. This came out of a lot of experiences with uh, living in San Francisco. We had a house there. The Delta pictures, the ones with the uh, rivers and lakes and so on, those come out of the Delta area. We spend a lot of time down there. The restaurant things come out of the experience of working in restaurants. So this is a little bit of like a diary of my growing up. The only way you can feel whether a figure is operating in a space rather than attached to the edges is to see if you can get the damn thing to operate in that space and to locate itself. Thibault has taught painting since 1952, first at Sacramento City College and then since 1960 at UC Davis. While officially retired, he's still a fixture of the Davis Art Department. I'd been teaching 35 years, I think, when I retired. So then I go back on a voluntary basis, but uh, since I'm working for nothing, they can't fire me anymore, and I don't have to go to faculty meetings. But then it's selfish. I get a lot out of teaching. Teaching has been very much a part of what I do. It keeps you, in some ways, uh, honest with yourself and what you're doing. If you are willing to say, I don't know, and go with a student to say, look, I can't give you any answers to anything. I can give you some tools to get at answers, to find out about answers, whether it's painting or anything else. There's also a life to be lived on a level of intimacy. And that interests me a lot, where the, so to speak, where the heart is and how we live with objects and concerns with eating, dressing, uh, walking. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
I think Robert Frost. He said, if I get up in the morning and uh, are able still to walk over, make my bed, all the rest of the day is gravy for me. <laughs> in a way, what keeps you going is the, the thrill of uh, experiment and, and expectation. That's what you do as a painter. You, uh, you live on hope, that next picture. The retrospective of Wayne Thiebaud's paintings continue at the San Jose Museum of Art until July 4th. On our one-hour broadcast next week, how the Torah Project at San Francisco's Contemporary Jewish Museum is breaking new ground. Competitions for the best recipes on food and wine this week, and a conversation with John Boland, KQED's new president and CEO. If there's a question you'd like us to ask him, go to kqed.org slash this week and submit it in my question of the week. And that's all for tonight. I'm Belva Davis. Good night. Funding for Spark on This Week in Northern California has been provided by the James Irvine Foundation, Diane B. Wilsey, and the KQED Campaign for the Future Program Venture Fund. Additional support has been provided by the following.